Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to my presentation of Defending Your Defense. The introduction is the three different apologetic methods. There's classical, ev evidential, and presupposential. These three have been most used throughout the years. Classical, classical apologetics is the method of apologetics that begins by employing various theistic arguments to establish the existence of God, such as cosmological, teleological, and ontological. Evidential is as it sounds. It is using evidence in and around us to demonstrate that God exists. Presuppositional examines the presuppositions on which worldviews are based on. I will discuss in short what each method does. However, the method I will be defending will be the classic, classical apologetics. Moving on to the third slide. Classical apologetics. You see, you're using the scripture for fundamental truth. Uses for scripture for undeniable truths, uses key doctrines, but there's lots of evidence that could be twisted or scientific explanations. Classical apologetics uses scriptures to lay out and point out fundamental and undeniable truths towards the existence of God. They also use key doctrines such as cosmological, teleological, and ontological and the arguments of the existence of God. Evidential apologetics uses scripture for evidence, uses archaeological evidence, and uses historical evidence as well. It uses for the scripture to, prov to provide evidence that God existed and Jesus walked the earth, such as archaeological or historical evidence, to prove the validity of the Bible. Such archaeological examples are, could be used of Bethlehem and Judea. Historical evidence could be used as the Dead Sea Scrolls or different accounts of the same events, such as the day the sun stood still. Presuppositional gives evidence or gives a base for arguments that the world views are based on. I don't have much to say about presuppositional apologetics method, but this is the hardest of three methods and one I don't use that often. You can find common ground with believers, but it's harder because you need to know their presuppositions before you can broach the subject with them on God's existence. But back to classical apologetics, and that would be my choice. There's lots of arguments that you can use. Is on cosmological argument and the cosmos challenges of beginner always. The cosmos had a beginning and the cosmos always existed, and we'll be touching on doors and there just a little bit. Now, a stated guide or publication that came into fruition is called the Truth Project, and this in particular publication brings to light the question of the great cosmological question. This is an era of high scrutiny of atheists to disprove the existence of God and of Darwinism theory of evolution. The video presentation and workbook included in the Truth Project instructs viewers to think about the vast image of nothingness, which I encourage you, the listeners and your viewers, to do as well. Now, when you think and picture nothingness, think about nothingness, 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 and then poof, everything we know. And existence comes out of nowhere. How is it that complex systems such as ecosystems, microorganisms, and human bodies just appear out of thin air? Think of everything in this world, everything designed off of something else. Even engineers have to create designs based off of something else in this world. How can the complexity of this world just happen from the Big Bang? We humans are too complex of a system to have just appeared in thin air. The argument of the cosmos can be looked at, for example, can be looked at, uh, at this explanation of always. But you can look at the second law of thermodynamics that is described by life science. The second law of thermodynamics dynamic states that energy is transferred or transformed more and more of it is wasted. Theoretically, energy is always transformed while being wasted. Energy doesn't last forever. The cosmos that was has always existed, then the energy that is being used should have depleted and have left for the shell what it was. Neither of these arguments are a definite answer to the question of the cosmos. They just don't provide the necessary evidence to support the claims that they make. And we look in the slides 27 through 34 of the Truth Project, we can look at the theory of evolution. Asmik Asmarov, Carl Sagan, and Richard 
Dawkins side and support Darwinism in various ways and statements. Dawkins' statement of, it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet someone that claims not to believe in evolution, that person is foolish, stupid, or insane. But that statement is terribly flawed and biased. We can look at Romans 12, 21, 23, and it reads, For all of the new God, they do not honor him, honor God, or give him, give thanks to him. They become futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, and animals, and creeping things. These scientists have stooped to a level where they don't accept the existence of God or of his creation. Thus, they have become fools despite their smarts. Move on to the next slide of the teleological argument of the classical method. And that essentially means a science is for God. We'll look at two different things here, two different examples of the bacterial phalangium and the lemon protein. There are many things that science has provided evidence for for the existence of God. Two of these points or like I said, of bacterial phalange and lemon protein. Bible.org recently published an article by J. Warner Wallace called Is God Real? This article presents that Wallace presents the bacterial phalange as evidence for God and for that intelligent designer. <laughs> for some background, the bacterial phalange is used to provide movement. However, the remarkable thing about the bacterial phalange is its complexity in the tail that provides itself motion. Wallace's article says this, quote, The flange has over 40 necessary interactive interreliant pieces, with just one less part for the lens fails to operate as effective motor it needs to be to successfully mo mobilize bacteria, end quote. The article goes on to say that irreducible complexity of this large-scale pieces means the finished design of limbs must be assembled in one sweeping step. It cannot be assembled over time, gradually. End quote. Now, right there, Wallace points out evidence that destroys Darwinism's theory that things evolve over time. If this flange wasn't designed the right way the first time, then it would have ceased to exist. Dr. Georgia Purdom recently completed a study in an article called Laminin and the Cross, 2008. And this article remarks on a protein that is found in the human body. For some information here, laminin is a protein that is part of an extracellular matrix in humans and animals. Purdon goes on to describe the actual job the laminin protein does. Quote, laminin has arms that associate laminin molecules to form sheets and to bind cells. Lemon and other ECM proteins essentially glue the cells, such as those lining the stomach and intestines, to a foundation of connectivity, connectivity tissue, end quote. So essentially, in a lemon and glue is, that holds, is the glue that holds humans together. It can be used as a reminder for scripture and the Bible of Psalms 139 verse 13 and 14. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. We can also look at Colossians 1 17 as, and he is above all things, and in him all things hold together. And the interesting thing about this lemon and protein is, if you look at it closer under the microscope, it actually represents a cross. We could further um, provide evidence or provide or an argument for that Psalms 139. Moving on to the next slide, to the ontological um, side or, or argument to the classical method. And that is saying if, if God created everything, then who created God? That we had a beginning, humans had a beginning, but God did not. Now there's a popular objection or thought that if God created everything in the known universe, then who created God? 
This popular question is intended to confuse or stop the Christians. Deuteronomy 33:27 reads, The eternal God is your dwelling place. We read from the very beginning of Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1 1. This shows that God began to create things, but critics use used the objection. It doesn't say who created God. But even though it's not stated in the very start, we can see throughout history and in different scriptures to different prophets where the word eternal or everlasting is used before God. In Deuteronomy 33 27, for example, we see the eternal God is your dwelling place. Isaiah 40 28 says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Now, Merriam-Webster defines eternal as having an infinite duration and everlasting as lasting or enduring all through time. And these two verses are just these two verses are just perfect examples as showing God as the eternal being, meaning that He's always existed. God never had a beginning because He is the beginning. We can read in Revelation twenty two thirteen, I am the Alpha, and I am the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, Jimmy Wallace published an article in 2020 called Who Created God? And in this article, Wallace states, quote, Ultimately, everyone points to something eternal that is the cause of all beings. Philosophers have long pointed out, however, that there cannot be an infinite number of events going back in the past. That's sometimes referred to as the problem of infinite regression. But think of it this way. Imagine we have a line of dominoes that can represent all events in the past leading up to today. Wallace goes on to say that any other line of dominoes, which one is pushed, the others will fall down in sequence. Once the first domino is pushed over, the entire line will fall. End quote. Now Wallace, Wallace finishes the article with this final thought. So since we are obviously exist in the, pre in the present, which is today, there must be a finite, limited number of events in the past. The philosophy of infinite regress demonstrates that time and our universe had a beginning. And that's why Christians have good reason to believe there's an eternal, uncaused cause of the universe, a being what we call God. End quote. I'm going to move on to those scientific explanations that we read about in the first couple of slides. And those explanations could be the Big Bang or theory or even timeless. But that is one weakness that the classical apologetics method has. They can be explained by these scientific um, explanations. But the world has a complexity about it that cannot be described as the Big Bang. That we are just so, we happen just to be distance just right from the sun as to sustain life, but not burn up or freeze to death. Did we just all form from nothing and then all of a sudden we were just here? There are too many variables in play for us to simply just to have appeared. And science has proven a great many details of evolution, and I don't doubt that some of the things today have evolved to survive, or didn't evolve to survive. However, the example of the flange can prove otherwise. As we said before, the flange is so small, and that, as Wallace says, that it must be assembled in one sweeping step. It cannot be assembled. It could not have been assembled over time. And that flange destroys that portion of Darwin's theory that things evolve over time. If it wasn't designed right the first time, it would not have existed. Like we said in the slide before, uh, for Jimmy Wallace, in that article he published, that like dominoes, once one falls, they all fall. And that philosophy of infinite regress demonstrates that we had a beginning. And that there was a being that we call God, an infinite, eternal bit being. Now, how do we come overcome those weaknesses? Well, we use concrete details and we have plenty of examples. 
Moving on to the next slide of does God actually exist? You can look at the second law of thermodynamics. The energy is always transformed while being wasted. Energy doesn't last forever. If the cosmos has always existed, then the energy that is being used should have been depleted, and we would have been left with a shell of what was. And go on to that Dolberism theory debunked. Well, it's safe to say if that you don't believe in evolution, then you are just ignorant, stupid, or insane. But we've referenced back to Romans 1, 21 to 23 there. That being, right there it says, they they became fools, exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, and animals, and creeping things. But we also need to look on the, like how would the scriptures be used to support classical um, method of apologetics. And you can look at the book of Genesis. A bunch of Genesis could use its foundation both a cosmological argument and a teleological uh, logical argument of the of the creation of things. And the book of John you could use for ontological for that God has always existed. He no one created him. We read there in John uh, verses one through four that the beginning in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Was with God and the word was God. In the beginning with God, all things were made through him and without him not only things were made. We'll move on to the next slide there. See how evangelism could work for the classical apologetic method we remember that he does exist that he has designed the world to create everything and he is everlasting and just use those same teachings um and evangelistic opportunities now some of those foreseen issues that you could have or weaknesses could you know revert back to the darwinism theory that people who hold tight to that such as carl sagan could argue that we all evolved from monkeys and when history and Bible dictates otherwise. Well, as we go on draw to a close here, we classical apologetic method does have a singular weakness that could be used with uh, scientific explanations. But with the cosmological, teleological, and ontological arguments, they are hard pressed to be proven wrong for the existence of God. I'm not saying they're infallible, but the evidence and the arguments that they bring forth are hard to dispute otherwise. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. Goodbye.